The Lord be with you. Welcome to our second Lenten midweek devotion in our series of the Crosses of Lent. Today we focus on the Cross of Humility, this saltier that you see right here, an X-shaped cross, also known as the Cross of St. Andrew. We hear God's word from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Chapter 16, beginning at verse 24. Then Jesus said to the disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save their life loses it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. For what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will then repay everyone according to their deeds. Truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. X marks the spot common line from many a pirate movie, seeking buried treasure. What young boy hasn't pretended to be a pirate following a makeshift map with a big X over the part where there's supposedly hidden gold? We see X's on the roadways, usually marking a railroad crossing. An X was a suitable line for a signature on very important documents years ago when people couldn't read or write. Sweethearts place X's and O's at the bottom of greeting cards to say, I love you, or hugs and kisses. In this Lenten journey, may an X mark the spot for you, the symbol for new life growing out of death. Certainly this rang true for Andrew, a man of humility. Andrew followed originally the teachings of St. John the Baptizer and became his closest disciple. He lived in Capernaum, working with fishing friends James, John of Zebedee along the Sea of Galilee. Following the preaching of repentance, he heard John's voice crying out of the wilderness, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By faith, Andrew saw Jesus as the Messiah and eventually introduced Peter and to Jesus. Andrew led many to meet our Lord, some Greek worshippers, then a small boy with five loaves and two fish, which fed over 5,000 people. Many biblical historians called Andrew the introducer, who humbly came to faith and yet boldly evangelized so that others would also be drawn to faith. Did he realize Jesus was working through him at that time? Well, we don't know, but that is God's way, isn't it? And so this saltier cross in the shape of an X that's printed right here next to me is associated with humility because of St. Andrew. According to legend and history, when facing martyrdom by crucifixion, Andrew requested that his executioners not crucify him on the regular Roman-style cross. Like Peter, he felt unworthy to die like his Lord, and so the X-shaped cross was used instead. What an example of humility to die for the faith and not to die in the same exact way of our Lord's crucifixion. In our Gospel account of St. Matthew, our Lord teaches us also about humility. Are we willing to learn from him? For that in itself is the definition of humility, someone who is willing to be taught, someone who is willing to learn something new. Oh, I may not have all the answers. Isn't that unusual? Maybe you don't hear that all the time either. In our day and age, we're all expected to be experts in everything, even things we don't know. Great leaders are great followers. Great teachers are great learners. If a pastor is a sound preacher, he ought to also be a sound listener. Jesus' words aren't difficult to miss. If you wish to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow. The cross so reverses all other earthly systems. It is totally opposite the way of the world that we're accustomed to seeing. Coming after Christ is a self-imposed weakness, losing one's life in order to gain a better life. 
pick up the cross Jesus gives. And that kind of self-denial will always result in total dependence upon God for everything. And he urges his disciples and anyone who wishes to come after him to be a disciple, to assume the cross as a mark upon their entire life. Maybe that's why Christianity isn't always a so-called popular religion. Because it means that life under a cross doesn't will give you the vacations or the time off or the looking back and reminiscing you would like. You don't receive the cross one day and then it's gone the next. And that's one of the most frustrating things for day-to-day -day Christians. We get tired of the cross. And the crosses we bear may be numerous because it's something we bear as the name of Christian, as the name of disciple, as a follower of Jesus. It's not necessarily the cancers or the colds or the surgeries or the broken homes or the stresses and anxieties. Everyone has those sorts of things. Crosses we bear come to us because we are a believer and a follower of Christ. How you bear those burdens in a Christ-like way, that is how the cross is born upon us. Is Christ in us our strength, or are we still trying to do it all on our own? You get tired. You grumble. You seek the same limelight and attention others want. Do you ever refuse to live humbly because it's gotten you nowhere? Is it easier and more fruitful to maybe criticize and pick at others if your life feels miserable or unfulfilled? Do we blame God? Do we blame others? Or do we ever just blame ourselves? We choose to live in guilt at times and anger and bitterness and then try to forget in other ways. Sometimes things feel too painful. But those sinful traits never stop nipping at our heels, never stop pestering us. You and I, though, can never try to satisfy them. We can never give in to the world's appetites because they're never-ending. And all these traits, they're all part of living in the world, even if we think we skirt them somehow. Our piety cannot cover that either. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. The world is ultimately empty. Doing things our own way is ultimately empty. It's a dead end in and of itself. Life with God is infinitely more valuable and blessed than anything else we can take upon ourselves. The life God calls you to deny and lose is for him. Because we're losing ourself, our own ways, our stubbornness, our sinfulness that gets in the way of truly living a life in Christ. And that's as good as dead anyway, so why not lose it? The life of Christ has its own way. He himself enjoyed intimate communion with the Father and devotion to the plan of salvation as he walked this earth as God in the flesh. Jesus never sought anything for himself. There were occasions when people wanted to reward him. Even the devil himself tried to coax him to take something as his own. The crowds wanted to make Jesus a bread king after he multiplied the food for them that fed all their bellies. Even upon entry into Jerusalem, one would think that he could have had anything he wanted. But in Gethsemane, Jesus prayed to his father, focus on his plan of death. Jesus knew why he was born. He was born to die. <clears throat> Even on the cross, he endured the jaunting jeers of those who offered, I'll believe in you if you come down from the cross. Let's not forget, Greeks seek wisdom and Jews look for signs. But as Paul tells us, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That is why the life and death of Jesus turned the world upside down. Against temptation to set one's own course, Jesus was entirely at the disposal of his heavenly Father. That is why he prayed. That is why he is the Son of Man, the second Adam, the true man for all people. That's what it means to be truly human, to be fully humble, to be fully under the life of another. If Jesus teaches us anything, he teaches us that to go and live in him, to live under the Father, is the best way of life because it means we give ourselves totally over to him. And he not only has our backs, he has our, in total, our total life, heart, 
mind, and spirit. This is why an X marks the spot. We are emblazoned with the cross of Christ because we have been baptized into his death and his life. Yes, his life. That's his resurrection. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father, Matthew tells us, with his angels and repay everyone according to their deeds. This speaks of Jesus' death, which was the glory of the cross and the payment for every sin. And this also speaks of Jesus' resurrection, which is the glory of God, so that all men may live and abide in him. And it also speaks of the last days, the judgment, when you and I, as sheep of the shepherd, will be gathered around the throne of God in heaven. The goats will be judged and sent into the eternal hellfires, but all who believe will have a place at the table of our good shepherd, who is both the Lamb of God and the host of the great banquet. Willing to be led is a good thing. Willing to be fed by the word of God, by the sacraments of grace, that is also a good mark of a Christian. Realizing you are a sinner and can do nothing apart from him, that you are totally naked without the robe of Christ, that is the way to live a Christian life. Humbly taking the living Lord inside of you through the bread and cup, what better mark of humility that is than witnessing to the world it's okay to be fed. It's okay to trust in God for all things. It's not just a ritual. It's not empty. It has meaning because of the faith we are given and the word of God that seals it with the Holy Spirit's promise. Whether it be baptism, holy communion, holy absolution, or the blessed gathering of all the saints together through faith. Where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus says, there I am in their midst. An X marks your spot. The cross of Christ and the cross of humility you bear in the world. Now many traditions about humble Andrew have surfaced over the many, many years. Some believe Andrew got as far traveling as Hungary and Russia with this gospel message, which is why he is their patron saint. Other traditions locate his activity in the northern provinces of Asia Minor, which is now considered Turkey, with Peter. An early church father, Jerome, and historian assured his readers that Andrew preached in Greece and met his death there. The proconsul of a town called Patras tried to restore the ancient ancestral religions and put an end to the new religion of Christianity. Andrew supposedly got jailed there. A riot ensued, and Andrew urged them to show humility and imitate the patience of their Savior. As tensions continued, the proconsul ordered Andrew's death. Granting Andrew's request, he was crucified on an X-shaped cross. He died around November 30th, which is reserved on the church calendar as St. Andrew's Day. Supposedly, followers of Andrew instructed people of modern-day Scotland with the Christian faith. Still today, Scotland's flag has this X-shaped embedded in its standard. The cross marks all of us as followers of Jesus, ambassadors to the world, Sheep among wolves, sharing a message of peace and humility that we draw closer to our Savior, bearing our cross with the strength of Christ who lives in us and is our life. By losing ourselves, we have nothing to fear because all that we have to gain is Jesus Christ and eternal life. An X marks our spot in the Christian faith, in the Christian church, on earth, and one day gathered in heaven. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond our human understanding, guard your hearts and lives in the one true faith in Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal Father, through your Son Jesus Christ, preaching and teaching, he called his followers to take up their crosses and go the path of suffering before glory. As we bear the cross on our brows from baptism and upon our hearts, may we, like Andrew, confess him as Savior of all and witness the transferring power of his cross to each and every person we meet. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Using the prayer our Lord himself has taught us, we boldly say together, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.